Okay, well, thank you and welcome to this uh, small but perfectly formed session uh, on uh, public diplomacy uh, during the Reagan period. Our first speaker is Ryan Singsank, who studied history at George Washington University and is currently a student in the dual degree master's program in international and world history uh, shared between Columbia University and the London School of Economics. His work broadly explores the complexities of Cold War diplomatic relations and military partnerships. Currently, Ryan is working on researching and writing a master's dissertation on the Live Oak Plan Planning Group, a Western military planning staff tasked with defending the city of West Berlin. So, um, uh, welcome, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, while I wish I was there in person, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, present here over Zoom. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and can see me all right. Um, so I will begin with uh, uh, presenting the paper entitled Being the Perfect Host of the Reagan Administration Thank you. 
the main blessing of your way by the fall of 1983, new uncertainties, however, will continue to arise regarding the scope of the plan for participation. The aftermath of the Korean airline crisis of September 1983 can do public debate. Should the U.S. ban the Soviets or allow their participation? Despite public clamoring for the U.S. to ban the Soviets, the Reagan administration is suspicious of the possibility. As outlined in the September 30th State Department accounts of Edgar Lincoln investigated the U.S. as banned the Bolsheviks. In order to properly uphold the Bolsheviks, the Lincoln recommended that the U.S. did not bar the Soviets or any other nation from taking nuclear weapons. Such a conclusion was based on his belief that, quote, the United States had much to gain by being the perfect host for the Clintons. He encouraged as many people as possible to come and see the wonders of the U.S. In any case, upgrade our role as a Lincoln host to the rest of the world, unquote. With Soviet American tensions at their highs in the 60s, the Reagan administration still didn't see the policy of Clinton as a war. Instead of pushing harsh rhetoric and hardline policies, he came with Moscow, Washington sought to use his approach to promote the Clinton war to a less confrontational relationship with the Soviets. A prudent Soviet request for Reagan to give the okay sent a clear message to Moscow that Washington was willing to cooperate on a naval basis. These were outlined on March 27, 1984, in the annex to Treaty 135, stating, quote, to ensure the full and equitable participation of all accredited families in accordance with the Lincoln Rules and applicable laws of the United States. We will also ensure the safe passage of the Anero Swap Pipeline with from our country and the visit of the Soviet vessel Rusica to a long beach harbor near the sea. Unquote. Although Soviet requests were specifically mentioned, the overall understanding of the Reagan administration was that no single country was to blame for the Soviet ending. Therefore, their proof of point was securing the presence of other leading economies in the region. Consequently, the Reagan administration's coordination with the Lincoln organizers took extra steps to provide financial assistance to their administrators to China, Romania, and Yugoslavia <laughs> in the months prior to the games. Thank you. While these three nations were more than pleased with the Reagan administration's efforts, the Soviet positions struck a different tone. By the springtime, Moscow was increasingly claiming that Washington was politicizing the games and not arranging for adequate security for Soviet athletes. Therefore, on May the 8th, 1984, the Soviets made the final decision to boycott the games. The following day saw other Eastern Bloc nations join in Moscow's boycotts, citing the unbearable conditions and their belief in what was a cavalier attitude of the U.S. authorities for the Olympic Charter. Yet the communist world did not universally accept the Soviet-led boycott. The presence of the PRC, Romania, and Yugoslavia helped the Los Angeles Olympics attain a more sizable global impact and helped underscore the weakness of the Soviet boycott to develop a truly unified bloc. Many believe the U.S. obtained its first public victory over the Soviets as the PRC enthusiastically rejected the Soviet boycott efforts. Such a decision was made easy in private, as Washington eased Beijing's concerns of safety threats to Chinese athletes and actively promoted other cultural exchanges in conjunction with the games. Yugoslavia also issued a quick denouncement of the Soviet boycott. As hosts of the 1984 Winter Games, the Yugoslavs remained committed to not letting international political tensions interfere with Olympic participation. Furthermore, as a leading power in the non-aligned movement, Yugoslavia's participation played a role in ensuring many African nations who were considering a separate boycott to ultimately participate in the games. The most striking condemnation of the Soviet boycott came from Romania. While other Eastern European nations privately expressed doubts about the boycott, they folded under harsh Soviet pressure. Romania, on the other hand, in an act of defiance against Moscow, believed the benefits of participating in the games outweighed boycotting them. The most evident benefits would come in the form of economic assistance. Mentions of guarantees of financial assistance to help fund Romanian participation in the Games by the Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee, combined with safety reassurances, were stressed in a letter from Reagan to Romanian President Nicolae Ceausescu shortly before a late May 1984 meeting in Prague 
of the Eastern Bloc Olympic Committee where Romania would announce its final decision. By the time the Olympic torch was extinguished in Los Angeles, it was clear to the world that the Los Angeles Olympics were an overall solid success. A record number of nations participated, new athletic records were set, and for the first time in decades, the games ran a profit. As a result, when speaking to the American athletes shortly after the games, Reagan stressed that, quote, the only losers of the 23rd Olympiad were those who didn't or couldn't come, end quote. The Reagan administration undertook sizable efforts to promote the participation of all nations in the Olympic Games, especially those from the communist world, even before the Soviets launched their last minute boycott efforts. Most significantly, the participation and rejection of the boycott from the PRC, Romania, and Yugoslavia proved to play an essential role in the success of the 1984 Olympics. The improvements in these countries' diplomatic relations with the US under the Reagan administration factored into their decision to compete in Los Angeles. As a result of its efforts to as, have as many nations as possible compete in the 1984 Olympics, the Reagan administration demonstrated a clear and consistent commitment to put aside ideological differences in favor of the Olympic ideals of peaceful cooperation through athletic competition. Thank you, and I apologize for any um, technical difficulties during that, but thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ryan. Uh, now, uh, let me introduce Brett Vakoda, who is currently at University of Delaware, but he's moving to Temple to be part of their film and media program. Brett has a PhD from Carno Carnegie Mellon uh, in cultural history and has a number of forthcoming pieces, including one in the Journal of Contemporary Iraq and the Arab World, and one in the Moving Image, and in the o Oxford Guide to the documentary. Um, Brett and I are currently both part of a uh, NEH grant to digitize USIA film, and we've worked together extensively over the years, <laughs> but I only realized yesterday that we'd never actually met, so I only knew him full face. So it's very nice to meet him in three dimensions rather, <laughs> yes, than, just, uh, rather than just two. It makes it uh, extra special. So Brett, uh, the floor is yours. I'll uh, grab the clicker from you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. All right, well, uh, thank you for joining. I know these are having taught at this time slot before. I know this is kind of the lazy hour of the afternoon. It gets a little hot. Everyone gets a little sleepy. So we're really appreciative of you uh, coming to the panel. Um, and I have to say, I am not a Reagan scholar. I'm a media historian. So I've, it's been such a pleasure, such a delight to learn so much uh, during this conference. So um, all right. Though the U.S. Information Agency produced or distributed roughly 20,000 moving image titles over its 46-year run, the 1982 television spectacle at Poland v. Poland represents a unique artifact within the archive. Its strange aesthetic and tonal hybridity, falling somewhere between telethon, documentary, and awards show, reflects a liminal, mo liminal moment from which it emerged in the USIA's history. On the crest of a reactivated Cold War, new capabilities in satellite television, and a vast shift in the culture of agency leadership. Let Poland be Poland not only signals a transitional moment for the agency, it also presupposes forces that were to shape USIA media in the coming years and the Reagan administration's policies that undergirded them. The ostensible impetus behind Let Poland Be Poland was to build international support for the Polish Sol Solidarity Movement, a nationwide workers' union that emerged in response to flattening wages, rising food costs, and poor working conditions. With Solidarity's membership peaking at 10 million in late 1981, provoking Soviet-friendly leaders to declare martial law, uh, namely Jaroliski in Poland, the movement reached a boiling point. And the American agency's brash new director, Charles Wick, saw his opportunity to make a splash on the global stage. And what became the most expensive production in the USIA's history, Wick gathered 23 world leaders, Polish artists and activists, and a slew of Hollywood celebrities to project a multinational consensus behind the workers' union, broadcasting Let Poland Be Poland live across television and radio to 46 countries and 39 languages. When Ronald Reagan nominated Wick, his close friend from Hollywood, uh, to run the agency in 1981, he inherited Jimmy Carter's U.S. International Communications Agency, or USICA. In the wake of the agency's often hardline approach to the Vietnam War, President Carter reorganized and rebranded the office uh, to reflect what he called the second mandate. 
uh, which called for USICA to not only tell America's story, which was the motto of USIA, but also welcome the perspective of other cultures into its own, prioritizing a much more dialogic approach to public diplomacy initiatives. The well-intentioned and at times effective, the media output of this era became uh, more fragmented and uh, to be quite frank, sometimes flat and unengaging. So Reagan and Wick therefore saw an opportunity to reel back Carter's changes, even returning the agency's name back to USIA in late 1982. Compared to the previous administration, Wick and Ra uh, Reagan in their first years uh, favored an agency model that reamplified, and uh, we've heard this word a few times, a more Manichaean, bipolar, uh, and globally rendered frameworks similar to those employed by USIA in its early period in the 1950s. In looking where to make his first mark, the research wing of Wick's USIA highlighted general unrest in Poland with wide support for solidarity, which sought to affect, quote, great changes in social order. The situation in Poland there uh, offered uh, a, a, an apt, apt opportunity, therefore, uh, through which to return to the political sensibilities of the early Cold War. And it served as a useful platform to help instantiate what Michael Dwyer called the Reagan era's dominant cultural fo uh, formation, pop nostalgia, which is primarily concerned with not the stylistics of cultural objects, so that certainly factors in, but the, quote, affective relationships between audiences and text. In other words, in the effort to bolster some of the geopolitical methodologies that echoed the 1950s, the administration could invoke salient cultural and rhetorical tropes uh, that were drawn from that era. During the USIA's first two decades, images from such events like the resistance fighting in East Germany in 1953, the Hungarian uprising of 1956, and the Prague Spring in 1968 defined the Cold War writ large in the American imaginary. So there's that word. The, um, in that tradition, Wick believed he could productively disseminate scenes of the Polish workers' resistance, leveraging them toward anti-Soviet sentiment. In line with another approach of the early USIA, the agency could also resituate, um, and I'll call it Marxist-adjacent uh, conceits. Um, uh, uh, so of course, the solidarity had its own particular connotation for the Polish, but, uh, but they'd render these conceits, uh, uh, these more leftist ideals, uh, into vague expressions of liberty and sovereignty. So relative to these earlier events, so Wick had more tools at his disposal. With new satellite technologies, he could coordinate a live global broadcast to premiere immediately after an international series of rallies backing solidarity. Using footage of the rallies uh, within the broadcast to further underscore the immediacy of the stakes. It could be a profound television and radio event collectively experienced throughout the world. During Let Poland Be Poland's development, Wick aggressively hyped the program and sought to maximize its reach attaching famous names from politics and show business, creating a network of private funding, and ensuring the program would be broadcast to as many televisions and radios as possible. First, he looked to Hollywood for a director that could strike an effective balance between spectacle and solemnity uh, with a li within a live satellite event. He hired Marty Pacetta, who had experience directing shows like the Academy Awards and the Grammys. Next, and this was quite a feat, uh, he and the agency recruited an assortment of 23 political leaders from around the world, several Hollywood stars, Polish artif artists and activists, and even the leader of the AFL-CIO to participate in the show. As the program gathered more firepower, early estimates put the budgets as high as $700,000, nearly half a million more than the agency's second most exp expensive production, the 1971 Vietnam Vietnam, which is around $250,000. Well, nearly all of the show's participants offered their services for free, um, except ABBA, as we've come to learn. Uh, the high production, yeah, which, yeah, that's a little fun fact for Nick, uh, Nick, Nick encountered. Um, the high production value translation fees and the cost of satellite distribution ballooned the budget. True to the administration's ethos, however, Wick found outside money to fund his spectacle, connecting this financing approach to the administration's, quote, philosophy of voluntarism and increased private sector involvement he recruited organizations like the Heritage Foundation and companies like Mobile Oil and Philip Morris, along with individual donors, to back the program. And as a boon to Wick's efforts, Congress declared January 30th as an official day of solidarity with the Polish people and opened up the domestic dissemination of the show to 297 local PBS stations across the U.S., which would have typically been prohibited per the smith Act. So this was kind of rare to see any USIA product within the United States. So you can see a list, too, of all the cities uh, to which it was broadcast. The Poland Be Poland premiered on January 31st, 1982, 
Uh, its bizarre combination, again, of spectacle, celebrity, and solemnity has the feel of an international telethon with the glamour and editing style of an award show, resulting in what I think is we could rightly call a surreal 90-minute television event. The description of the opening sequence within the program script, as we see here, uh, previews the pathos-laden tone and general aesthetic of the show. It begins, as the script describes, with, quote, images of normal everyday life before the imposition of Jaroleski's martial law. Uh, when these images are later, dr quote, drained of color and replaced by black and white shots of recent events in Poland. Following a fade to black in which we hear the voice of Charlton Heston speaking from the darkness, which I'm not sure if any of us want that experience, right? <laughs> uh, uh, he lights a candle and then he goes on to introduce the program. And let's hope this clip works here, I think. In solidarity with the people of Poland to hear from new countries all over the world. All right, so this opening statement uh, hints at what was perhaps a key purpose uh, to the program for the agency. Couching mention of the technological prowess of a global broadcast, broadcast within a sweeping and idealistic rhetoric celebrating and claiming the global community. In addition to Heston, uh, two other MCs lead the viewers uh, through four different elements interwoven throughout the program. First, Heston takes us through an historic assemblage of political figures claiming, quote, never before has such an array of world leaders gathered together under one electronic umbrella. Heads of state, such as UK's Margaret Thatcher, France's Francois Mitterrand, and Iceland's Gunnar Thordson express their support of Polish solidarity in recorded 90-second speeches. Second, actress Glenda Jackson, uh, with a dynamic digital map behind her, points our attention to rallies occurring throughout the world on the Day of Solidarity using on-the-ground footage to give evidentiary weight to the theme of global consensus. Third, Swedish actor Max von Sydow details the history behind the solidarity movement, introducing segments featuring talented Polish artists and dedicated activists, which in many critics' views became the highlight of the program. Fourth, a variety of scenes featuring American celebrities, such as Bob Hope explaining radio jamming, jamming Frank Sinatra singing Ever Homeward, and Henry Fonda uh, giving an ironic reading of Frederick Ingalls serves as uh, interludes throughout the show, often undercutting the more earnest tone within the rest of the program. So film, uh, film uh, nerds out here, this is actually Henry Fonda's last on-screen appearance. He won an Oscar a month later. Uh, he didn't attend. Jane Fonda accepted on his behalf. So this is the last time we see Henry, Henry Fonda on screen. Although WIC promised nearly 300 million viewers, uh, more reasonable guesses estimate 180 million people tuned in to let Poland be Poland. Um, they always kind of exaggerate the numbers in USIA. Uh, so following the program's premiere, critics' reactions were mixed, many questioning what exactly it was they just watched. Time magazine labeled it, quote, a singular crossbeat of documentary and star-studded entertainment, politics, and theatrical pizzazz. The Christian Science Monitor called it worthwhile as propaganda, though, quote, dull and sometimes repetitive. And reviews outside of the U.S. were generally more negative, uh, such as the one in the London Daily Mail, which argued, quote, only in the United States would such a vulgar spectacle be mounted. <laughs> And the Soviet news agency, TASS, expectantly went further, calling it, quote, a provocative act of telesubversion. And I love that term. I mean, it's such an interesting jargon, telesubversion. Uh, the only really positive, glowing piece, uh, I think unsurprisingly, was Roy Cohn, uh, right in a piece <laughs> for the, his favorite spot, the New York Post. So as Wick's tenure as USI director continued throughout the whole of Reagan's presidency, Let Poland Be Poland seemed to presuppo presuppose three key trends that came to inform agency media throughout the early, especially the early 1980s. Uh, one, for much of Reagan's first term, the more widely disseminated USIA films and programs, such as those covering the Soviet-Afghan war, 
reflected the rhetorical tone of Let Poland Be Poland, pigeonholing complex geopolitics into reductive good versus evil binaries that underscored Reagan's reamplification of the Cold War. Again, this changed as we've learned throughout this conference uh, a little bit later in, in his presidency. Uh, two, as the funding model behind the program foreshadowed, private and partisan interests had more means to influence agency operations, which often came into tension with agency officials still upholding Carter's second mandate. Three, and perhaps most importantly, let Poland be Poland, though imperfectly, establish proof of concept for the agency's investment in televisual technologies. They got a ton of funding in the 1980s. Wick was an excellent salesman, and I think this was the, like one of the key launching points. So this is uh, to conclude. Uh, so in late 1983, the USIA launched its first uh, its live World Net press conference to mitigate the fallout of the US invasion of Granada, allowing journalists throughout the world to speak directly to leaders like Gene Kirkpatrick. What was originally a specific type of program, uh, WorldNet later became the USIA's brand to, to what many identify as the first truly global satellite network. And you can see the map right there, this, the scale, the scope of uh, WorldNet. Um, so uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s, WorldNet offered prolific and diverse programming output. However, none of it ever quite matched the strange hybridity of Let Poland Be Poland. Thank you so much. I think I've I think I've managed it. Yeah, and then I guess presenter mode. Am I? Uh, how do I? Oh, you're you're good. Am yeah. I good? You're all set. Yeah, it's up there on the screen, so you're okay. all set. Lovely. Okay. So, um, uh, hello. Thank you for being here. I'm Nick Cull, and I'm a professor of public diplomacy at the, the University of Southern California. And um, what I want to talk about today is of what I call the forgotten process, and that's the way in which USIA, uh, the United States, which had been in an accusatory confrontational mode with the Soviet Union uh, in the first part of the Reagan, uh, in the first Reagan administration, in the second Reagan administration was part of the communication equivalent of the kind of disarmament that was going on in um, uh, the mainstream arms uh, negotiations. So. Um, the reason that I want to talk about this is because right now in the world we face a confrontation over information. Information has become weaponized. And to me it just seems logical that when we're confronted by a weapon, it's time to have uh, a negotiation about that weapon, especially if uh, that weapon is causing difficulties for us. So there's a precedence uh, for conventional arms control, which I'll talk about, uh, and then informational arms control. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Cold War propaganda, and then I want to get into the summit process and how a summit process with the Soviet Union around issues of information maps onto the um, uh, wider uh, end of the Cold War story. I think we can go here through to the 1990s and see a legacy in um, Soviet-American uh, relations and sort of some positive uh, trends uh, with lessons for our own time. So first of all, something about precedents. Well, there, there are basically four different kinds of disarmament. The imposed disarmament, where a victor uh, takes away uh, a, a, a country's weapons, um, like the way in which post-war Germany and Japan lost their militaries. Unilateral disarmament, where a country voluntarily gives up a weapon system, like the way that South Africa uh, resigned its nuclear weapons uh, as apartheid ended. Multilateral disarmament, like the uh, post-World War I naval limits or post-World War II chemical weapons uh, agreements, where all the countries agreed to step back from using this particular system. And then bilateral disarmament, where two antagonists agree to uh, reduce uses of particular weapons, like the strategic arms limitation talks in the Cold War. All of these have equivalents in information. Uh, imposed information disarmament, well, I think that when Germany and Japan were forced to close down propaganda channels and submit to allied re-education, uh, that was a, an attempt to disarm Nazi and, or uh, Japanese militarist propaganda. Unilateral information disarmament, well, following World War I, the US became convinced that propaganda was very dangerous and attempted to draw the fangs of propaganda through mass media 
uh, literacy programming in, in the US. Uh, multilateral, uh, we see this following World War I with special cultural programs of the League of Nations designed to uh, reduce hostility between countries and uh, with UNESCO, which is explicitly angled as a forum for um, removing the causes, the cultural causes of war. There are also bilateral information disarmament examples out there in the world. The most interesting one to me is the way in which France and Germany agree to read each other's textbooks and revise them and take out portions that each finds uh, offensive. Interesting because the US and the Soviet Union agreed to do this uh, in 1977 and actually managed a mutual textbook review process, uh, which is, as I said at the top, forgotten. Uh, propaganda was a big part of the Cold War. In fact, I think you can see the Cold War as essentially a propaganda struggle. Uh, there were some direct attempts for the Soviets to propagandize the United States and vice versa. Uh, most famous examples being the radio broadcasts between the two, uh, the two blocks. But the, the more common form of uh, propaganda in the Cold War is third country work, where you pick countries that are exposed to the influence of the US and or Soviet Union, and you try to maximize the appeal of your system in, in that place. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, initially puts a lot of uh, attention on trying to, on a sort of a charm offensive to the world, but by the 1970s, as it was becoming increasingly difficult to represent the Soviet system as successful, they switched to a spoiling agenda and became very involved in disinformation and circulation of fakes. And so one of the big uh, problems for the US was the Soviets making stuff up. Uh, and these uh, narratives the, of uh, faking and of uh, disruption, we all know uh, the Soviet Union put a lot of energy into the Kennedy assassination uh, uh, conspiracy theory, for example. Though there was cultural uh, negotiation during the Cold War, including a cultural treaty in 1958, which allowed exchanges of students, joint uh, exchanges of exhibitions, publications in one another's countries, and performers like uh, Dave Brubeck went to the Soviet Union, Boris Kristof came and uh, sang uh, in, in the UK. Um, the context of these exchanges was not actually understanding one another, rather it was a hope that each bloc thought that its culture was more attractive and if only Russians heard Dave Brubeck or if only uh, uh, Americans heard Boris Kristof, they would see the superiority of the other's system. Uh, cultural um, uh, compromise or is part of the Helsinki Accords in 1975, uh, which increases exposure to one another's culture, but this is still all about maneuvering for advantage. Uh, the Cold War included some uh, joint activities. Um, uh, sometimes it was as a Soviet, uh, the, the World Peace Council is explicitly a Soviet uh, front. There were some people-to-people uh, -people, uh, meetings that laid groundwork for, ground, for arms control. Um, I think that the story of the um, negotiations, um, the uh, uh, media disarmament in the, uh, at the end of the Cold War really begin with detente. Uh, there's hope in the textbook review process that started, and I'll say more about that in a moment, but it has to be suspended when the invasion of Afghanistan takes place. Uh, another really interesting people-to-people -people story, which is forgotten, is the, the joint satellite TV programs called Space Bridges, which connect ordinary Russians with ordinary Americans for people-to-people uh, -people dialogues, including special programs where women talk to women. There's one where scientists talk to scientists. Uh, war veterans talk to each other. Uh, and there's, um, they have nuclear safety engineers within three months of... Chernobyl talk to each other about the problems of making sure your nuclear safety uh, programs are um, uh, safe. These were primetime shows in the Soviet Union. Uh, rare, uh, not so widely seen here, but it's a super interesting thing. Also, there were citizen-to-citizen -citizen meetings. The Chautauqua Institute um, arranges for meetings between 
groups of Soviet citizens and uh, Americans, both in the, the um, US and uh, in um, alternate uh, venues in, in the Soviet Union. The, so the textbook process was run by a man called Howard Merlinger, who was an Indiana uh, professor. Uh, in the exchanges, um, the Soviets complain that uh, their role in World War II is neglected uh, and uh, managed to get some revision. Uh, the U.S. complain that the Soviets are fixated on a story about Americans giving Native Americans smallpox uh, using blankets, which is always linked to an, uh, modern examples of alleged U.S. use of bio uh, weapons. The uh, dialogue over textbooks ran through till 1989. The overall conclusion of this meeting, of these meetings, was that it was perfectly possible to correct facts and key textbooks were amended. What they found that they couldn't correct was the underlying ideology, and they still had the sense of talking at and past uh, one another in the formal meetings. Everything changed in November 1985 with the meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev in Geneva. They agreed to recommence exchanges, uh, including sharing um, New Year's messages to one another's audiences. And Reagan gave an amazing performance in his speech to the Russian people, where he talked about uh, what Americans like to do at Christmas time, which is go on a car trip and maybe enjoy a roast goose. Uh, so I, I don't know quite where he got all that from, but it, uh, the Russians just loved him and uh, really seized on him as a figure of hope at that point. Immediately after the success of Reagan's broadcast, um, there is a, a meeting between uh, Charles Wick and the outgoing head of uh, Russian propaganda, uh, Leonid uh, Zamyatin. And um, the, between the two of them, they propose a truce in the war of words. Among the first things they agree is that documentary film crews should have mutual access to one another's country. Uh, Zamyatin complains about Hollywood, uh, particularly Rocky IV and the ABC drama America about Russians conquering the United States. Wick explains that in America, the government has no control over the media and says, well, do you think we liked uh, the day after? Absolutely not. It caused great problems for uh, the US administration. He says the public are arbiters, whether we like it or not. Rick, however, Wick, however, was ridiculed for his soft stance on the Russians and was seen as being foolish for apologizing for Rocky IV. However, uh, exchanges could recommence. Horowitz came to play the piano in the US. Dave Brubeck uh, went to the Soviet Union. Sorry, Horowitz and Brubeck went to the Soviet Union. The Kirov Ballet and an exhibition of art from um, the Hermitage came to the USA. Um, in the summer of 1986, uh, just as they're about to have a citizen-to-citizen -citizen meeting, uh, an American journalist, uh, Nick Danilov, is arrested for spying. There are protests, and eventually he is released. Uh, Gorbachev claims that elements in the um, uh, U.S. are hostile to dialogue, but the re reality seems to be exactly the reverse, that there are people in the KGB who do not want dialogue with the Americans, uh, the situation is solved with mutual expulsions, and it's possible to recommence uh, this process of talking about uh, mutual propaganda. I think it shows the fragility of dialogue and the fact that peace has its enemies, which is also the uh, plot of Star Trek VI. But uh, that's, uh, you know, they're always drawn from life. In October 1986, uh, a side meeting takes place in Reykjavik uh, between Wick and the new uh, number one person in Russian propaganda, Alexander Yakovlev. It takes place at the small Saga Hotel. Yakovlev objects to VOA reporting of splits within the Politburo, comparing that to Nazi propaganda in the 1930s. And the VOA, uh, uh, the US raised the problem of uh, VOA being, being jammed. Wick dramatically offers to trade access to the US airways for the Russians uh, in, in return for an end to jamming. Uh, 
However, he says this without checking US laws, which <laughs> forbid broadcasts from a foreign country on American domestic stations. The Russians say, well, we don't care. We're going to broadcast from Cuba anyway and begin broadcasting from Cuba on American wavelengths. So I don't know if any of you were in uh, Florida in the 1980s, but you would get interference from Russian transmissions. The most important uh, part or moment in the uh, Soviet-American uh, media dialogue is a, a meeting that takes place in 1987. The most serious problem for the United States was the attempt of the Soviet Union to link the uh, AIDS, the HIV AIDS crisis, to being an American bioweapon. And this is a media uh, Soviet press cartoon showing a, 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 an American scientist selling the virus to the Pentagon. And the virus, each of the little viruses is a little swastika. Uh, the uh, U.S. raised the problem with the Soviet health delegation in April 1987, and they tie it to a threat. They say, we will end cooperation in AIDS research unless you stop claiming falsely that AIDS is an American creation. Wick lets it be known that he will escalate and suspend all health cooperation. The State Department published evidence showing bad faith Soviet publicity around AIDS worldwide. By August, it had begun to reduce. Uh, and in October, uh, Gorbachev becomes irritated by further reports that uh, there is still Soviet uh, publicity around the AIDS libel. It seems that uh, Gorbachev's request that this be done had not been followed through. So he feels humiliated uh, and turns it off like a tap. So for the rest of the uh, Soviet uh, period, uh, this, this goes away as a, uh, as a story. To me, what it shows is that sometimes, rather than responding to communication with communication, a, a hard power direct negotiation can be what you need. Um, moving to uh, the formal uh, um, negotiation, um, in December, Gorbachev comes to uh, Washington in December of 87. Wick raises the problem of disinformation yet again with Gorbachev, who says, look, it's all over. There'll be no more lying, no more disinformation. Uh, it's going to be a new day. And Wick says, well, if that's the case, let's have regular information talks. And so the regular information talks begin. Running through what these, uh, what's interesting about these talks, first one's April 88, uh, the Russians and the Americans have great problems because the Soviets um, insist that um, the American media must be monolithic, and the Americans insist that their media is nothing like the Soviet Union. So they have great trouble establishing an analogy for how their systems work. Um, they agree that they have to do something, however, about mutual stereotyping. Uh, by September uh, of 88, it's possible to have a meeting in Washington, uh, but this is where the American private sector becomes more involved, especially uh, Jack Valenti, who's there to try and find uh, markets for Hollywood in the Soviet Union. Uh, they agree to uh, certain things like intellectual property rules, always Jack Valenti's concern, and to the mutual opening of radio uh, bureaus. Uh, the most interesting thing to come out of the September meeting is an early warning system about disinformation, a specific media hotline, so that if the Russians spot something in the American media that is untrue, they have a number to call to change it, and vice versa. Jack Matlock said this number was never used, but has confirmed that it was in, in place. Third round of talks. Uh, things are changing rapidly in the Soviet economy. It's no longer uh, Wick's USIA, but his replacement, uh, Bruce Gelb, who represents the Soviet Union, who represents the um, US. Uh, however, the Soviet uh, interlocutors are dealing with a systemic collapse. So when uh, Gelb mentions that he's aware of food shortages, Devadim uh, Medvedev, the um, Soviet propaganda minister, uh, Medvedev, who's sitting right in front of a giant picture of uh, Lenin, says, Mr. Director, our system has failed. Uh, and at this point, the whole um, information talks become something more about uh, the Soviet Union trying to 
uh, get something from the Americans to soften the blow or to manage their transition to a different kind of uh, economy. In February, the Soviets suspend their medium wave broadcasts from Cuba. They agree mutual access to journalists. Uh, they uh, confirm uh, print corrections. Uh, and then the talks come to an end. In the 1990s, the Russians recognized pioneers from this process, including the um, uh, Merlinger, the textbook guy, and John Wallach, who'd started the uh, citizen to citizens dialogue via Chipakwa. Uh, Chautauqua, sorry. Uh, the Soviet interlocutor Fallon uh, relocates to Germany to manage a sort of a German uh, Russian reconciliation process. Another of the senior foreign ministry people from Russia uh, m moves away from negotiating with the Americans over media and instead goes to the UN where he launches a program called Dialogue Among Civilizations. Uh, Wallach goes on to work in other problems like uh, Israel-Palestine, founding an organization called Seeds of, Peace. Seeds of Peace. The U.S., however, pulls back from public diplomacy as a whole in the 1990s, feeling that somehow a uh, mission is accomplished. Uh, the Russians, um, however, feel that they have lost the information war and begin a process of rearming in information space, seeking unilateral strength. And that this is what we're now experiencing, is Russia's application of the lessons learned from the media Cold War. So my lessons, weaponized information needs a process. You have to expect doubters and enemies on your own side. You can't uh, manage a process like this without leadership from the top. Negotiations can help. Uh, it certainly de delivered indicators of goodwill and cultural respect. Um, I think that the response to disinformation was, was successful. Uh, it was helped by, this whole thing is helped by the perceived um, symmetry of Soviet and American power. The Russians and the Americans were prepared to talk as equals because they saw each other as equals. As soon as the Soviet Union slips, and the, 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 the logic of these talks is lost. And the Soviets go from being equals to being supplicants, trying to learn from the Americans and to um, uh, locate themselves in an Americanized media uh, world. Progress doesn't mean that objectives are shared. It's made more complex by divergent world views. And the shift into a victory uh, narrative on the American side, I think, is one of the tragedies of the of the of the situation. But I expect that's a minority view uh, at this uh, conference. Um, so that's what I wanted to say in my own uh, part. Um, I'm very grateful for the ways in which my paper fits, as I'm also chair of this session, to what Ryan said and what Brett said. And just to set things up for for Ryan. Um, Part of the Soviet hostility to the LA Olympics was a specific disinformation campaign around um, the Olympics, telling African nations that if they went to LA, they would be subject, subject to attacks from Klansmen. The other thing is that the Chinese presence is part of a narrative we're also living with right now, uh, as LA was an important moment for China's emergence in international cultural affairs, and the Beijing Olympic bid was first announced during the LA Olympics in uh, 84. With Brett, uh, what I wanted to say is, I think part of what Wick was trying to do was to imitate the kind of television event that had been attempted with the concert for Bangladesh, and then would be successfully done with uh, Live Aid and the concert for Mandela later in the 80s. But you know what? Like your uncle dancing at a wedding, the U.S. government is just not the right person to organize a spontaneous, um, uh, so right idea, wrong actor. So that's what, but uh, wait, so thank you, guys. Um, uh, questions for uh, uh, the panelists? I guess we should uh, Can we, make sure he's Yes, uh, we should make visible. sure Ryan's visible. So yes. I'm going to... Uh, let me see, where's my Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe could, Thomas, could you? Uh, Robin. Um, I was struck 
about that, your discussion of Soviet disinformation and, and spreading absolute lies of how much it reminded me of the Trump administration. Sure. And I'm wondering if the resolution of that suggests any way of dealing with how we ought to deal with the Trump campaign now spreading absolute lies. It, if it worked in dealing with the Soviets, are some of the things you're talking about, do you think they'd work with Trump? Um, I, th I think there are certain elements of dis certain strategies of disinformation which we know are universal. So uh, tactics like what's, what is called pre-bunking, when you know somebody is going to say something and so you say, my opponent will tell you X. If you can say it first, when they themselves say it, they make the situation less less credible. I think Trump is a different situ is a different case because he has such a loyal audience that predicting that he's going to say something is relatively easy, but his audience is super loyal to him. I think it helps to just give people a lot of education around um, media literacy and how propaganda works uh, because I, I, I think Trump has a textbook on propaganda and he goes through the, um, in, in 1937, uh, an institute called the Institute for Propaganda Analysis published seven key tactics of propaganda, a list that school children were taught to look out for. The first one was that propagandists think of a nickname for their enemy. Uh, the second one is that propagandists promise glittering generalities. So they talk about winning not saying exactly what they're going to do to succeed, and so on. Um, all of these are Trump's own rhetorical, they're like the dominant tactics of, of Trump. So I think Bannon might have set this list in front of him and said, or Roy Cohn, and said, look, this is how you, this is how you do it. I don't, but what do you think, Brett? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think we're dealing, if we're to kind of analog this with kind of the, the Cold War dynamics and Soviet disinformation, I think one thing that Trump does differently uh, is plays on that impulse or that kind of desire to have access to secret knowledge. His surrogates, namely QAnon, are really kind of taking advantage of that. And that's something that the Soviets didn't necessarily deploy too much, but it's, it's, it's a really kind of vicious... I think that like, the Soviets do that with their conspiracy stuff. That's true. Because they yeah. play, they recognize an unexplained phenomenon. Where does this virus come from? How does a man as well protected as Kennedy suddenly die? Or Rajiv Gandhi, how can that happen? They recognize That's the true. gap, and then they create a narrative that fills the gap that people feel smart for passing on. So the mm -hmm. same principles of a reward coming from uh, repeating a rumor are, 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 fueling, are fueling both. So I think that... Um, and that's incredibly amplified now, of course, it's in, social yeah, media. It's social media. Yeah, I, I no longer say I teach film and media studies. Now you talk about media literacy. I say I teach media literacy. Like, that's, I've completely shifted my pedagogy to account for the times. I still, of course, like, you know, play the hits. But, like, I mean, I think it's, it's important to kind of emphasize the need to kind of integrate this into but the But one of the problems that we have is that we know teaching somebody media literacy doesn't fix the their susceptibility to propaganda, what it does is it makes them worry about their neighbor's susceptibility to propaganda. So it's called the third person effect. And it's a really well, it's why teaching people about advertisements doesn't ruin the, adver the advertising industry. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a great, yeah, that makes sense. David. Not questions, of course. I'm going to do that horrible thing that, that people do is <laughs> talk about things that are parallel and interesting. One is the fact that with the collapse of the, of the Berlin Wall, that the um, a number of Eastern European countries introduced media literacy, not to thwart US government propaganda, but to thwart US capitalist propaganda, which was the introduction of US capitalist media into those regions. And they introduced it from kindergarten up, um, which is a kind of a fascinating observation. The second is to say there are a number of players that overlap with your stories um, and the research that I've been doing around the day after. A least of which is that there were rogue publicists who ran with copies of the day after who went on to be involved in the Space Bridges project in helping to create the means with which both societies could start to use satellites to communicate with 
And the mayor of Lawrence, Kansas, was very actively involved in helping to invite Russian citizens to come and stay in Lawrence, Kansas. He and then was invited to um, to uh, to Moscow and got given a tour of of the Kremlin um, as a as a result of all of his attempts and and work with trying to build a better understanding um, between these two communities. Um, but to bring us up to date a little bit, um, we are living in a moment where there's this rising tensions and disinformation between, of course, the U.S. and China around information and technology and all sorts of platform peril. Um, it is an un, uh, uneven sort of symmetry where um, the Chinese have maintained a very effective means with which all Western information, including Hollywood, is now being purged of any kind of, of any kind of negative connotations around Chinese content. But what's also interesting is the fact that Chinese content doesn't go out in terms of film and television, but one of the most successful forms of information has been through Chinese social media Wong Hong creators mm -hmm. who project a Chinese traditional culture, of, namely one of them is Li Qi Qi, who has over uh, 10 million followers mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, and because she represents a, uh, a traditional Chinese culture. So you have very little and very limited uh, projections of contemporaneous Chinese culture, but you have these kind of rural and very deeply imagined Chinese um, culture that's being portrayed around the world, in many ways replacing what once was the primary role of the Confucius Institutes in trying to create a better understanding around Chinese culture. So we see a new age kind of information disinformation paradigm playing out between the new superpowers that is still being played out, I think, even in the, in the context of the way the Biden administration has framed the, the t and escalated some of the tensions or but I, around Taiwan. But I think Taiwan. one of the opportunities is that China wants to be taken seriously. Right. And part of the problem is there's a tremendous asymmetry of knowledge. So uh, the there was a meeting between the European, U European Union uh, cultural teams and uh, Chinese cultural diplomats, and the European Union uh, experts were asked, how many of you speak Chinese? How many of you have ever systematically studied China? And nobody had, whereas everybody in the Chinese delegation had decades of knowledge. Uh, and that asymmetry made things really, really different. So I think until we have... Uh, uh, the desire of China to be known gives us an opportunity for uh, for ex for um, exchange, and and is I think we need to be looking at information disarmament with uh, with the ch with the Chinese, and so this is part of uh, sort of writing at the moment. What I'm, Robin, you wanted to jump in. Well, I have somebody from Lawrence, Kansas. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just wanted. This to was like a shoe that had to drop. At that some the, point. the the mayor of Lawrence got a lot better deal than the Russians invited to Lawrence. But I do have an anecdote about the power of kind of the Manistodian public school. I have a current doctoral student from China, and in the, her first couple of years of doctoral study, she would occasionally say things that were clearly things she heard from the Chinese government. And as she's been exposed to global media and seen kind of contrary data, she stopped saying those things. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, there, is a, there is a power of being exposed to conflicting information. I also want to say I find it uh, uh, distressing that we did a better job of teaching how to detect propaganda in 1937 than we are doing now. <laughs> But this is one of the questions, uh, is who has the interest in, who, in whose interest is it to cure Americans of their dependence on propaganda or their susceptibility to propaganda? If Americans really understood how media worked, that would be, make it very difficult for Sean Hannity, but also for Rachel Maddow. You know, I, th I think that, that there's a reason why... Um, uh, the, the American media has let us down and we can't look to the American media to um, save us from um, uh, exaggerated uh, information. And in fact, looking at the overall century of misinformation, 
it's amazing how much, how many problems have come from the commercial media, including in some of the classic cases like World War One. It's the commercial media that are doing the most provocative stuff, not government uh, agencies. And whereas the commercial media blame the government, but are actually cashing in them, them, themselves. So, uh, but uh, Ryan, do you want to say something uh, from there in Zoom land to <laughs> round things off? Well, this is completely out of my forte of expertise, but a very fascinating um, discussion. And uh, uh, just a comment on the point that you made earlier, Professor Cole, on the, um, the sort of Soviet uh, information that went out regarding uh, African nations to potentially boycott. That was something very fascinating that I found um, in my research as well. So I'm, I'm very glad that you brought that up. 